for all we know, this whole concept of model minority is a myth. And it is proven that it's a myth. And there is, there is research as an immigrant, of- right? You're always, it's kind of like you're holding your breath and trying to succeed and, and be the best so that you can, you can hold on to this position that you're It's in. happened even with my five-year-old, four-year-old child at the time. Uh, he used to ask me, why are you not an American? Why am I an American? And mm-hmm. I used to have to explain it to him. And mm-hmm. it was not an easy conversation to have, but I had no. to have it. Welcome to the Nerve to Lead podcast. Here we explore power, pleasure, leadership, identity, belonging, parenting and couplehood and explore stories of navigating through life, finding both authenticity and attachment through the common lens of the nervous system. I am your host. Sangeeta Parthasarathy and I'm so glad you're here. Today I'm joined by Suvarna Krishnan. Welcome. Um, So Suvarna, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit for our audience? Sure. Uh, I'm Suvarna Krishnan and uh, I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, a long way from home and I work at a a big company, a tech company, and I'm a director of software engineering at this tech company. I have a six-year-old son. He is a a whole bundle of joy and I I love playing around and having fun with him. And uh, I also am uh, a graduate from uh, the uh, infamous slash famous (laughs) Vits Pilani uh, as, uh, you know, as is Sangeeta. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me uh, and in a nutshell. Thank you. I think um, I met Swana when she was 18. I want to say yeah. maybe 17. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we've known each other since. And it's just so beautiful. Uh, you know, you look back and think, oh, my God, I've known you for so long. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. So we've known each other for a long time. And then we've also worked together in a um, client provider capacity. So I'll start off with this. Um, race, gender, and uh, being the right, uh, right kind of non-white in technology. <laughs> yeah. So uh, talk to us about um being in a leadership position in a tech company uh but being the right kind of non-white and uh, what that's <laughs> like <laughs> it's a very interesting uh bunch of uh adjectives i want to say i mean uh and uh, I, I get that uh, it may sound like a a funny question but it has a lot of deep meaning there and, and there is i really appreciate you like talking about it um, so I moved here to uh, Boston in about 15 years ago, and uh, I have always been a uh, been in tech. Um, I've always uh, worked in computer programming, and I've kind of climbed the ladder in tech. And I used to wonder, like, I mean, it, it, whichever company I worked for originally, uh, it was a minority-run company. So mm-hmm. I was always surrounded by minority uh however uh it was considered that the kind of people that worked with me are a model minority right because most of them were brown and indian or asian so um having surrounded by this group of people uh it it used to make me wonder like everything they did was you know a certain way right And uh, what I felt was there is this whole need to confirm to this model minority myth. Over the period of years, I've realized that anybody who is brown or Asian has a certain, you know, um, way they do things, right? And uh, there is reason behind it. And there is this also the subconscious pressure to conform to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm considered a millennial, but I'm mostly a Gen X. But our generation is like, intentionally not doing it but then subconsciously they have this need to conform to it because of the fear 
because we are immigrants, right? And there is a fear of not being able to uh, uh, move ahead in your career or if you don't conform, right? There, there is that fear. And for all we know, this whole concept of model minority is a myth. And it is proven that it's a myth. And there is there is research out there that there is it's just a way people kind of um, back then um, pushed this high achievement into minorities and made that the big deal, right? So uh, I feel like that is what has propelled me, you know, as a brown woman in a new country, I had to stick to the, the, script. the agenda, yeah. right? The, the script. <laughs> and I yeah. had to do what I was supposed to do. And for me to get wherever I was supposed to get. And I had that, that was my only thing that I concentrated on. I worked my ass off. I improved my skills that I kept fighting imposter syndrome. And all of this is a result of wanting to conform to that model minority myth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it is not just my struggle. As you may know, there are a lot of women like mm -hmm. me who do struggle with this issue. Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. are minorities, right? Who are mm -hmm. brown or Asian or um, any any other minority? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Tech is such a field where your skill set and all of your you know your work is is looked at with a fine tooth comb, and you are being assessed year after year. Your your capabilities are being assessed, and every year you need to outperform your yourself. Really, if you think about it. And that is the precedence our previous generation has set for us, right? As immigrants. And that is what is expected of us. And that itself is a lot of pressure for anybody our age. Um, mm -hmm. even, even if they are men or women, it doesn't matter what gender they are. This is the amount of stress and pressure that they'll have to face to mm -hmm. be able to conform to that you know, script. And mm -hmm. to be able to achieve the success that is, you know, set for them. Success, is, that is success mm -hmm. for us, right? Like success is not having a happy day. Success is not enjoying, you know, being a mom. Success mm -hmm. is not enjoying being a dad. Success mm -hmm. is getting a promotion. Success mm -hmm. is um, being able to um outperform yourself or get an award or being be employee of the month or employee of mm -hmm. the year but again i i think that pressure is uniquely high for people like us who are immigrants for various reasons right like there is pressure from outside there's pressure that they'll have to face within the family uh again asian upbringing and then moving to a new country making sure that uh, you are the right kind of uh, non-white, like you said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, all of that. And I think it's still happening and it's still the case um, that you have to be that. It shouldn't be, right? It shouldn't be the norm. It shouldn't be how it is. Um, success should be about doing what you enjoy. Success should be about um, uh, wanting to do something that you really enjoy doing and it shouldn't be something like okay to be successful you do abc right everybody's success is unique and it's about them and it's about their lives uh it cannot be a script that you have to follow so which is what i feel like is is something that everybody needs to address and look at and at least mm -hmm. think about yeah, and I think it's very interesting, all of those aspects that you mentioned. Um, the thing that you said about tech, I, I remember this. I can't remember what year it was, but that was the year that uh, San Jose became a majority minority city, which is so weird when you think about the labels, right? What is majority minority? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> there are parts of tech in the U.S., uh, which are majority minority companies. I try, I think of it like that, um, which means that not only are they run by first generation immigrants, whole company, uh, its employees, etc., are 
majority minority right minority. Let's, you think about it <laughs> so then there is a cultural aspect to this you know belonging and identity and othering and all of that and then there is a very real first generation immigrant survival related anxiety i don't know you know hasan minaj says it really well about the difference between his father and him when you immigrate and it doesn't matter when your passport changes or if it does at all so uh-huh. we all first generation immigrants have a passport identity and then we have a cultural identity and then we have a gender identity we have a political identity and all of these get you know superimposed on each other and we have all of these very faceted you know different dimensions i think to that but i think the the first generation survival anxiety is very very real i think that is the thing that yeah um what, you know the model minority and and uh, confirming to the script and what success means i think success still is survival energy right like so there mm. is yes there's promotions and all of that but success is also down paying a house you know buying that yeah. car sending children to private education things in you know, this extraordinary focus that because achievement knowledge academic success equals survival you know and yeah. i think that that is what makes the first generation immigrant journey extraordinary you know it's a tale of survival yeah. you know and the shadow side to that is that when you have two nervous systems in a household predominantly wired for survival, survival. every day mm. rather than mm-hmm. thriving and by survival i don't mean we are refugee immigrants right like it's not yeah. but there is still a very real threat now now we're in the middle of recession and layoffs and it hits people that are visa dependent very very differently yeah. because your right to stay in this country is not taken yeah. for granted you know and again yes. it, i don't think it's about the passport as much as about the space that you're allowed to take the privileges that you're afforded uh, and you know the gratitude for the opportunity that's in front of you and that hyper focused survival which means that over a period of time there is a dissociation from various racial and other issues which is what yes. makes you a model minority because you're able to dissociate from issues of race and gender and just kind of plow on and be grateful for being given the opportunity to come into the country it's the servitude yes. the colonial british colonial servitude that we have and that's so internalized in our bodies white yes. first notions like trying to be why i mean whether you're in the an immigrant in the states or you're in india we all have that very deeply internalized you know with the colonial you know trauma in our bodies and unfortunately yes that's what makes you the you know model minority you know the going above and beyond and you know all of that i think this is the dichotomy right? i think these are all traits that uh help you know indians immigrants you know first generation tech educated people that go to not just survive but really build you know um try reroot themselves try. and thrive uh-huh. in an economic sense and then yes. i wonder what it does to the nervous systems parenting intimacy ability to slow down and savor the success etc i mean we're so focused on as we do right uh, to um create stability i suppose and then there is that latent fear yeah. that we live with throughout that permeates yeah. into every aspect of our lives i think in career and you know all, all those different aspects uh, i want to shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about diversity and inclusion in this context now you are a woman of color in a leadership position when you look at the approach to dni how do you see it? in general if you ask me corporate america there is a lot of opportunity for dni and um, a few uh, companies are i want to say doing it um, have have initiated it and they have the right intentions uh, however 
America is a very homogeneous, you know, comparatively a homogeneous country. There is not much diversity in terms of um, population, right? Like as opposed to India. Oh, yeah. You turn anywhere, you see diversity there. So we are attuned to kind of uh, that kind of diversity. I was, I grew up in India. So I am always looking for, you know, diversity around me, but that's not the case here. There is a lot of, um, you know, assumptions and stereotypes about what a diverse population is, which I think is why there is opportunity in um, getting better. But maybe a year ago, the whole concept of DNI was like a buzzword, right? Like everybody was talking about it and uh, obviously, there was AIs that were built that had bias in them, and that kind of triggered a whole conversation about diversity in hiring uh, and diversity in executive positions and um, all of that. So I think uh, it's moved on from being just a buzz- buzzword, and it's become more of a, a core uh, aspect for many companies because of the generational change, right? Uh, so there is five, five, six years ago. Trump became president and that kind of triggered a few things and and it kind of emphasized more on the importance of inclusion and uh, eventually diversity. And now there is also this generation of kids who are graduating and uh, going into the workplaces and, and they are expecting diversity and it's it's because it's it it helps, right? Diversity has been proven that whenever there's diversity, the innovation is much much higher, right? And I even have data around that research, and I've looked at it myself. And um, it is true. I mean, when you have a diverse uh, workplace, you do have more innovation, and there is more uh, chances of uh, making sure that you're not biased. You're not building something, especially in in the tech world, when you're doing AI research or machine learning, you want to make sure there's no bias, right? And and having a diverse group of engineers or a diverse group of people whom you work with is going to have an impact. And again, uh, a lot of the laws have, you know, I mean, it it has gone both ways, either ways in America, but uh, a lot of, um, you know, support for you know various lgbtqias and um, all of all of the other you know general minority groups has mm-hmm. uh, it has gained some traction right mm-hmm. uh, in the past mm-hmm. few years especially because of the whole uh, whatever happened with trump's presidency and mm-hmm. all of the things that happened and followed after that and various supreme court um, judgments that we passed yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so all of these political change has actually, in some ways, forced corporate America to start and look at DNI as an important criteria or an important mm-hmm. aspect for their own companies, and that is a good thing. And but then, as I said, America is a homogeneous con- country when compared to countries like Indian, the Indian subcontinent, or anywhere else. So there is a lot of work to do, and um, it's only the beginning, if you ask me, it's the tip of the iceberg and there is still a lot of work to do and there is a lot of opportunity. But then the trend is good. Like the, it's trending well. That's that's mm-hmm. what I want to say. Right. Um, and the younger generation is really passionate about it, which is amazing. And there is a lot of diversity that I see in corporate America among the younger population or the, the early career population, right? Uh, I mean, not not really younger, but early career, I want to say, like when there is not enough diversity at positions that are decision making positions, Mm -hmm. bad decisions get made and bad precedences get set, right? Like what happened in the Supreme Court, (laughs) (laughs) Um, stuff like that, right? So Mm -hmm. there needs to be that urge for uh, DNI at higher levels. Um, and it's good that the early career is is good at a good level. In most companies, it's the case uh, from what I know. Uh, but as you grow, uh, I think women have their own issues and women have issues with career. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But I'm just saying like, you know, ha- being a woman and being in tech and having a career is not going to all work out all the time for all women. I mean, honestly speaking, right? It's... There's a lot of right place, right time, right partner, right family, right 
there are so many other things that actually are playing a part in in this particular thing so absolutely that is one of the one of the reasons and again there are other issues too right uh, people's confidence levels and immigration trauma as you said there is mm. um, even other trauma right like yeah. minorities in general right absolutely um, yeah yeah so all and of I that think, plays um, a part yes yeah absolutely i think i just want to zoom out and talk about dni uh, as just a practice i feel like and when i worked in the corporate uh, world in america and uh, in the uk i've always been uh, very interested in uh, and been a part of diversity related panels etc however obviously now i think the conversation has changed uh, thankfully and evolved i almost feel like that you know we have to start with the basics you know we can't talk about othering and belonging and inclusion uh, without talking about the systemic forces at play and and what it does to people's nervous system i think you're right, you know inter- we're talking about diversity and dimensions and there is what's exciting for me is that it's opened up uh, a large canvas in which we can layer some very basic fundamentals about othering and belonging at a very nervous system level as to you know when you think about the nervous system and attachment this uh-huh. as human beings we're all biologically wired to connect that's part of what makes us feel safe and there is a social engagement part of our nervous system that is constantly building these connections about cues of safety and you know we talk about psychological safety in the workplace but again that is also a very cognitive way to think about it but you know belonging and safety and othering are are actually very very of uh, early nervous system imprints that then influence the way we show up for ourselves as well as others and uh, can't be truly inclusive or diverse if human beings don't feel safe with each other at a nervous system level like an autonomic nervous system to nervous system safety and i think that's very exciting to be able to offer dni through that perspective uh, mm-hmm. you know beyond and layer the cognitive stuff on top but also mm-hmm. be able to zoom out and look at othering and belonging as a bodily biological function uh, i think that's very very exciting and uh, it's kind of one of one of my goals for this year is to be able to offer that to uh, you know dni initiatives and leaders to add more dimensions to the work uh, sure and now a small break to talk about more resources We've created a guide called the Immigrant Nervous System which walks you through first generation rerootedness and all its various aspects. It is free for you to download and use. It is available as a link on the episode show notes. Now back to our conversation. um so shifting back a little bit to uh the conversation we had earlier about nervous systems and uh, high achievement um uh, model minority and you know sticking to the script what it means to be like that first generation uh, immigrant and make it i think one of the biggest uh, two things that i want to talk about is the impact of that Uh, on career and success which we've obviously discussed i think it sets us up uniquely to grab hold of opportunities and uh grow um and build success and personal wealth yeah. and uh have voices and build financial safety nests for ourselves and our children and i think yeah. that spirit and that you know flowing on um 
has all of those uh, positives, I think, in, in career and finance and personal uh, wealth building. Talk to us about parenting. And then we become parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then that, oh, that puts us in this real big paradox yeah. um, of... I have had to survive and I have had to find my place in the society and, and like uh-huh. be acknowledged or whatever. Right. And, and now we have uh-huh. our passports, we have the houses. There is a survival need that has been fulfilled largely by that, the first generation. And then you have children who, who don't quite have that prerogative that you had, you know, roof over the head, the right to stay in the country, even if you didn't have a job. How does that ch- does it change? You know the, the the lens, or are we still parenting in a survival based capacity? Tell us tell us about immigrant parenting. It's definitely we do have that basic survival based parenting <laughs> happening, like <laughs> in parts, um, and it's a conscious effort to actually let it go. Right, I know what you're talking about when it comes to like this. Um, insecurities about uh, your ability to stay in the country or uh, your visa and your job controlling every um, everything about your life right I've been there and I'm glad I'm not there anymore obviously that is something that was a big part of my life uh, at some point Um, yeah Yeah. it's a huge part of my life and I used to be very um, concerned about it because my son is an American and uh, I used to have this fleeting thought that, you know, it, what if something happens and I'm at this border and I'm I'm talking to an immigration officer and um, I'm trying to enter the country with a visa and, and for some reason I'm deported, but my son is is there. I'm not really concerned about the deportation. I'm more concerned about what could happen because of all the, the horror stories you listen to, right? And it's probably never going to happen, but it might, right? (laughs) Because you're an immigrant and you're still not, you know, um, an American. So Mm -hmm. that there used to be discussions about, you know, it's happened even with my five-year-old, four-year-old child at the time. Uh, He used to ask me, why are you not an American? Why am I an American? And Mm -hmm. I used to have to explain it to him. And Mm -hmm. it was not an easy conversation to have, but I had to have it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, how do you explain this to a four-year-old? It's quite impossible if you ask me, but whatever we can do, we can try to do and, and be honest. Right? And, and you know, that... identity is belonging, identity is attachment. And for the four-year-old, yes. am I different from you? You know, From you, exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's his parent that he's talking to, right? Yes. He's not talking to somebody mm-hmm. else. It's, he's talking to his That's own right. parent and he he's bringing in these ideas that, oh, okay, I'm, pro- I'm the only American in my family. Like, he mm-hmm. still says that I'm the only American right. in my family because I don't have an American passport, right? I, right. I yes. still am an Indian. So we're very open about it in my house and we talk about it and, and he's aware of that and I'm glad he is. But what kind of, uh, you know, is this something that might traumatize him in the future? I don't know, right? Because mm-hmm. he, he is not a first generation immigrant and he's That's an American right. child. Mm-hmm. And I have no clue how this can be handled or what is the best way to handle it. But here we are, right? And the other aspect to all of this is as an immigrant, right? You're always, it's kind of like you're holding your breath and trying to succeed and, and be the best so that you can you can hold on to this position that you're in, right? Uh, hypothetically, mm-hmm. like the proverbial yes. position you're in. Absolutely, in this country, your space, right? Yeah, your and space, your yes. space, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in this country, and you don't want to let it go because letting it go means you have to do a lot of work to rebuild it elsewhere, right? That's right. That's right. And it's as if you are letting go of all this work you've done to build this, right? That's right. Build whatever it is that you have. So it becomes it. It is kind of taking over everything in your life, right? Mm-hmm. Thankfully, we have done a lot of work, and I have lost that you know feeling that I used to have but yes it used to be overly you know what to say all all in all encompassing all yes uh, it'll take over your energy your uh, day-to-day uh what you do next and what kind of jobs you're looking for or everything right um even today 
every immigrant on a visa is going through this right and absolutely it is not an easy thing to just forget or come out of unless you actually work on it right mm-hmm. um i'm glad i i did work on it i'm glad i pushed myself to do it and i'm glad i'm here and i really wish everybody puts in that work and and tries to get out of that feeling that is overpowering you every day um however i think it is something that is inevitable as an immigrant and it's something you need to acknowledge and and know that it's going to be there right and yes. you get over it in time mm-hmm. right um and yeah so that i think is as a mother that was one of the biggest struggles for me but um i've gotten over that and this concludes part 1 of my conversation with zuvarna see you in the next episode Thank you for joining me today on Nerve to Lead podcast. The music you hear in this podcast was created by Soundcreed. You can find their link in the description. Thank you to Vaishnavi and Pavitra in Team Sangpar for producing and editing this podcast. Did this episode resonate with you? If it did, please share it with your friends, family, co-workers or clients we would also love to hear from you drop us a note on www.sangpart.com <laughs>